As I said, to Thank improve you, the cost Polly. of living. The time for this debate has now expired. <clears throat> Before we move to question time, I was asked uh, on Thursday to review uh, the Hansard, and I make this following statement. During question time on the 28th of July, I undertook to review two lines of questions to determine whether they met the guidelines in Odger's Australian Senate practice that, and I quote, supplementary questions are appropriate only for the purposes of elucidating information arising from the original question and answer. They are not appropriate for the purpose of introducing additional or new material or proposing a new question. Even though such a question might be related to the subject matter of the original question, Minister Wong asked me to review questions asked by Senator Mackenzie relating to the foot and mouth disease outbreak in Indonesia. Senator Birmingham identified that the questions each related to answers given by Minister Watt on the subject the previous day. If that was the intention, the questions could have been framed so as to make the connection clear from the outset. Senator Birmingham asked me to review a line of questions from Senator Ciccone on the same topic. In my view, the thread from the original answer to the supplementary questions here was easier to discern, and no one took a point of order in relation to those questions. Senate practice has changed since President McKellen provided the guidance on supplementary questions in 1986. In September 1996, Pres President Reid noted that many supplementary questions have now departed from those principles and have simply become additional questions. In August of 2018, President Ryan noted that the Senate has become, whether it should or not, somewhat more liberal in its application of those provisions. When supplementary questions were introduced, they were meant as a way of clarifying the answer to the primary question. Now they almost always flow from the original question rather than its answer. This is no doubt because senators write their supplementary questions before the primary question is answered. If senators, if senators want to return to the original intention of supplementary questions, I'd be happy to refer that matter to the Procedures Committee. In the meantime, I encourage senators to make the connection from the primary question and answer to the supplementary questions clear. We'll now move to question time, and I call Senator Hume. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallio. The Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations said recently in Gladstone, People will be seeing in their bank accounts what the change of government means. People will be seeing in their bank accounts a wage increase. Can the minister guarantee that there will always be real wage increases, in, will real wage growth under an Albanese Labor government? Thank you, Senator Hume. Uh, minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I'm going to get that right this question time. Um, and I thank the uh, shadow Minister for Finance on your position, um, and thank you for the question. Um, it is somewhat surprising that I would get a question like this this early on from those opposite who, let's not forget, as a deliberate design feature of their economic architecture was to ensure low wages or no wage growth for a decade. And I think the, since we've come to government, we have been clear that getting wages moving is part of our economic plan. We have these challenging set of Senator circumstances McGuire. where the price of everything is going up and people's wages have been going back for the last decade, essentially, okay. under your government's you? economic architecture. Order. So we have a job to do. There is no doubt about that. And getting wages moving is a key part of our economic plan, just as it is dealing with the decade of wasted opportunities and wrong priorities on you know, a failure to land an energy policy which is placing upward pressure on bills that are people are feeling in their pocket. So yes, we have provided a submission to the minimum wage case. That has handed down a wage outcome for those on the minimum wage. Uh, we have supported that, something that never featured in part of your government when you were in government, your submissions uh, to the Senator Fair Work McGrath. Commission. Not once. In fact, you had a whole section on the importance of low-paid workers in the economy. That's how far you went. 
So we are absolutely determined to get wages moving. I think if you listen to the uh, media reports and the questions of the Treasurer, Madam President, it's Senator, very difficult uh, to Minister answer Gallagher, when you're getting yelled at. Your seat, please. Oh, uh, no, she hasn't finished her answer. I've sat the minister down because I'm having difficulty hearing her answer. Please continue, um, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, getting wages moving to assist households to deal with the increasing cost of living, particularly the inflation challenge that we're thank dealing you, with. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Hume, second, first supplementary. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam President. So, given the minister has refused to guarantee real wages growth, and the Treasurer's economic update predicting that real wages are in fact falling, does the minister stand by the previous statement of the Minister for Employment and Workplace Rela and Relations that it's not a recovery if people's wages are effectively going backwards? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And we have to, to uh, continue on. We have inherited a very challenging set of economic uh, challenges from those opposite as a result of nine years of wasted opportunities and wrong priorities and a, a former government that was determined to make sure that people's wages went backwards. We have come in dealing with higher than expected inflation, and we are determined to get wages moving by submissions to the Fair Work, work case, by supporting those wages claims like <coughs> aged care workers That's currently right. before the Fair Work Commission. These are the things that a government can do. It can help to shape the policies that deliver the wage outcomes for people, and we do want them to get moving, but we are facing a uh, Resume your seat. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Birmingham, please. Senator Birmingham, Se Senator Birmingham, you stand, and then I give you the call, and then you start. You started to speak as you were rising, so please start now. Sorry, President. I was trying to be efficient in the use of time. Um, but, uh, uh, President, point of order, direct relevance. Uh, the minister, in relation to this supplementary question, has been asked very clearly about a quote attributed to one of her ministerial colleagues and whether she stands by that quote. Now, she has now, for some 49 seconds, talked around and about the broad topic, uh, but has not come directly to the quote. Thank you, uh, Senator Birmingham. In the um, supplementary question, there were references to other ministers and um, a real wage increase guarantee. I believe that uh, the minister is being relevant, but I will continue to listen carefully. Um, please continue, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I can assure the Senate that every single minister in an Albanese Labor government is focused on ensuring that we ease the cost of living in, on households, yeah, yeah. that we get wages thank you, moving, minister. and that we deal with nine expired. years of the Senator Hume, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. So the Treasurer recently said that there is no credible economic forecaster in Australia right now who thinks that wages growth is going to keep up with inflation. Does the Minister agree with the Treasurer that the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations isn't a credible source when it comes to wages? And isn't it true that an Albanese government has already broken its promise on real wages growth? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. And I, I honestly cannot believe that the gall of those opposite to talk about real wage growth when it was a deliberate design feature of your economic architecture was to suppress wages. The reason we're in the position where we haven't had real wage growth is because you, when in government, were determined to put pressure on wages growth and make sure there wasn't any. Every minister in this government is focused on making sure Australians get more money in their pocket, whether it be childcare, whether it be through reducing energy prices, whether it be through getting wages growing, whether it be training for the, skill, the jobs of the future, the high skilled jobs of the future. These are the areas where government can make a difference. We've hit the ground running. We're doing the work that you lot didn't do for the past nine years. Thank you, Minister. You're, uh, I'll now move to Senator Nampajinka Price. Oh, beg your pardon, nope. beg your pardon, Didn't. Senator. My error, Senator Stewart. President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. 
Can the minister outline the Albanese government's plans for a voice to parliament? Minister Wong. Uh, I thank uh, Senator Stewart for, I think, her first question. Is that right? And congratulate her again and welcome her uh, to the Senate. Um, over the weekend, the Prime Minister gave the most significant speech on Indigenous affairs by an Australian Prime Minister since the national apology to the Stolen Generations. He outlined the government's plan to implement the Uluru Statement from the heart in full. And specifically, he laid out plans to enshrine a voice to parliament in the Constitution, proposing a referendum question for consultation. Do you support an alteration of the Constitution that establishes an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice? It's a straightforward proposition. It's a simple principle, a question from the heart. Our starting point is a recommendation to add three sentences to the Constitution in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as the first peoples of this country. One, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Two, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to parliament and the executive government on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And three, the parliament shall, subject to this constitution, have powers to make laws with respect to the composition functions, powers and procedures of the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander voice. We are seeking momentous change together, but it is also a very simple one, because at its heart it's about consulting our First Nations brothers and sisters, our First Nations peoples, about consulting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples <coughs> on the decisions that affect them. It is nothing more and nothing less, and as the Prime Minister said, it is simple courtesy and common decency. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Stewart, your first supplementary. Can the Minister please explain, explain how a voice to parliament can support practical outcomes and closing the gap? Minister Wong. I thank the Senator for her supplementary question. The voice will be an unflinching source of advice and of accountability. It's not a third chamber. It's not a rolling veto. It's not a blank cheque. It's a body with the perspective and power and platform to tell the government and the parliament the truth about what is working and what is not, to tell the truth with clarity and with conviction. So it's not an either or proposition. We can and must do both. It won't delay our plan to train 500 new Aboriginal healthcare workers or stand in the way of our new investments in life-saving kidney dialysis treatment. It won't slow us from upgrading roads or expanding education and economic opportunities. On the contrary, recognition and a voice will accelerate progress because the accountability of the voice will help us get on track to close the gap. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Stewart, second supplementary. Can the minister explain to the Senate the Uluru Statement from the Heart process leading to the voice to parliament? Minister Wong. I thank Senator Stewart for her supplementary. There are now more First Nations parliamentarians, including uh, the good senator, than ever before, and that does make an enormous difference. But elections mean parliamentarians come and go. And the voice will exist and endure outside of the ups and downs of election cycles. And let's recall that the statement from the heart is the outcome of the most significant consultation process, the most significant consultation process of First Nation peoples Australia has ever seen. It builds on the work of the expert panel on constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians and the 16-member referendum council. There had been many years of consultation by the time the council travelled to 12 different locations around Australia and met with over 1,200 1,200 Indigenous representatives. And whilst I respect that there are differences of views, including this place, I do urge senators to recognise and respect the years of concerted Thank you, Minister effort Wong. that has got us has this expired. far. Senator Nampajing for Price. <clears throat> Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister, representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator Gallagher. Will the government inform Australians of its plan for who will serve on the proposed Indigenous voice and how they will be selected prior to asking Australians to amend the constitution? Thank you, Senator. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And I can certainly um, 
start to provide an answer, but um, if there is more information that I can provide uh, to Senator, I will following uh, question time. I think the idea that the Prime Minister outlined on the weekend uh, is for the consultations uh, to commence on a whole range of detail about progressing this to the referendum stage. And I think the Prime Minister was very clear on the weekend that he didn't want to, um, to determine um, arrangements without consultations with First Nations people. Um, but the regional voice arrangements will be put in place and they will provide a nationally consistent uh, system for First Nations people and government to work in partnership at the regional level. And they will, the regional voice arrangements will complement a First Nations voice at the national level. Obviously, there will be uh, consultations across the board, not just with First Nations uh, communities, but also with uh, state and territory governments. But if I can uh, provide further information uh, for the senator, I will do following question time. First supplementary, Senator Nampajinka Price. Thank you, President. What process has the government put in place for Australians, including Indigenous Australians, to provide feedback about the proposed question and approach to the voice? Thank you, Senator. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. Um, my understanding is that there has been deep consultation uh, with a whole range of stakeholders around um, the development of the advice that has informed uh, the speech the Prime Minister gave on the weekend. Um, obviously, there's been the work that previous parliaments uh, have done, um, but also the work that Dr Karma and Dr Langton have done, uh, which has helped inform the position that the Prime Minister outlined on the weekend. But, and I think the Prime Minister has been clear about this, that. Uh, that there needs to be a lot more discussion and consultation and listening from government as we proceed to the next stages um, of the referendum process, and that will be done. This is being done in the spirit of cooperation, collaboration and goodwill. And, um, Thank uh, you, Minister. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Nampajinka Price, second supplementary. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. Prior to the vote on The Voice and noting the government is fast-tracking abolishing the cashless debit card, will the government outline its alternative plans for tackling alcoholism, drug addiction, problem gambling, violent assaults and sexual abuse in Indigenous communities? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, I thank President, I thank uh, the Senator for the question. I think the, the outline that the Prime Minister gave on the weekend was that we want to consult further, listen, get the details right. Oh, no, I mean, that is the approach the government will take, whether you guys like it or not. In relation to the second part of the question, um, we, we are working with the Northern Territory government in relation to specific supports that need to be on the ground in the Northern Territory. But obviously there are a whole range of programs that are funded from the Commonwealth in partnership with the states and territories to support First Nations communities across the board, whether that be in health, uh, social supports, housing, education. And those, of course, will continue, but with greater purpose from this government than from, the, from previous arrangements that have been put in place where we seek to collaborate, to cooperate and to listen to First Nations communities. Thank you, Minister. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, um, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. How does your proposed constitutionally enshrined Indigenous voice to parliament affect First Nations people's sovereignty in this country? Minister Wong. Well, thank you, um, Senator Thorpe, for the question. Uh, I think uh, the government's made clear uh, that uh, the, uh, we will look to implement uh, in full uh, the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which, as you know, goes to voice, treaty and truth. 
Uh, I understand that you personally have a different view about the order of those achievements or, or those, uh, those objectives. Um, they're not, you know, from our perspective, given the level of consultation with First Nations communities that led to or that grounded the Uluru Statement for the Heart, uh, we are proceeding uh, respectfully uh, in accordance uh, with that statement. Uh, and I would make this point, and it picks up really what Senator Price uh, asked my colleague, Senator Gallagher. Uh, I appreciate that this is, a, you know, this is a big change for many people, and I appreciate that there are those who wish to um, ask questions of detail. Sometimes, uh, even if those questions were answered, they would not change their position. I respect that. But um, Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Thorpe. Uh, just a point of order, uh, just going off track, so, is it? Relevance. Relevance. My question was how does going into the Constitution affect First People's sovereignty in this country? Thank That's you. all. Thank you, uh, Senator Thorpe. I believe uh, the minister is being relevant. Minister Wong, please continue. Well, as, I, as I understand mm -hmm. what has been put to us by the uh, the representatives of First Nations peoples, as outlined in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, is that uh, they are seeking that we respond uh, first to the voice uh, um, before uh, our, you know, moving to uh, treaty and truth. I would make the point that the enshrinement of a voice is both symbolic, but it is also pragmatic. It's symbolic because it will in include, include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the founding document of our country. Uh, it is pragmatic, uh, given that there is no systematic process uh, for First Nations peoples to provide advice to Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Thorpe, first supplementary. Thank you, President. How does the Prime Minister's proposal for a referendum honour the principles of free, prior and informed consent, as defined in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which Labor supported in the last parliament? Minister Wong. What's the question? I, I, I'm sorry, I might have misheard, but I couldn't actually hear the question in that. Well, okay. uh, uh, just, uh, Senator Thorpe, wait for the call. Minister Wong, I'll ask uh, the Senator to repeat her question, if the clocks could be held. Thank you, Minister Thorpe. Uh, Senator Thorpe. Minister will, be, will do. <laughs> How does the Prime Minister's proposal for a referendum honour the principles of free, prior and informed consent as defined in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which Labor supported in the last parliament? Minister Wong. The, the, the Prime Minister is seeking to implement not only an election commitment, uh, but a call from First Nations peoples for this action. Uh, so, uh, when you talk about consent, uh, my view, what I'd put, what put, what I'd put to you, Senator, through you, uh, President, uh, is that the consent is a representative group, a representative group which has come together. I appreciate you may not agree with it, uh, but people from across this country, First Nations peoples, have come together and they have asked for this. They have put out their. I don't know if Senator Thorpe and Senator Price wish to. Do you want me to continue, or do you want to? No, 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 Minister, no, no, uh, no. Senator no, just... Mackenzie, interjections are disorderly. Minister, my, my please point, continue. My point is this: I appreciate that you have a difference of views, but we are responding to. Uh, and Senator Dodson, I'm sure, could speak with much greater eloquence than I. Uh, the call from First Nations peoples across this country, as exemplified Minister and Wong, as captured. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Thorpe. Point of order on relevance. Uh, as the only sitting member in this place that was at Uluru, it was no consensus, there was no consent. Senator I was Thorpe, there. Please you? resume your seat. Uh, the minister is being relevant to the question that you asked. Minister Wong, please continue. Well, uh, this is a, a call oh, your that we has wish to expired. respond to. Um, Senator Thorpe, second supplementary. Will you legislate for a Makarata Commission before any referendum? So we want a treaty before the referendum. Will you legislate it before the referendum? Minister Wong. 
Uh, if I can, uh, I know that uh, Ms. Burney uh, and the attorney have had uh, some consultations on this, uh, and if I, uh, and I think the phrase co-designing um, uh, was was used, but if I can get further information about the timing of that, uh, I will do so. I'd make the point uh, that uh, you know, we we are seeking to progress this reform uh, in the. It, it, in the priority that we have been, that has been identified by First Nations peoples. As I said, I appreciate that isn't your view, but is the view of the great many um, who came together uh, to form the Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, who, who, are also, who are also democratic representatives in their own right, who are also democratic representatives in their own right of their peoples, and we are responding to that. Uh, but if I can get uh, further information about uh, the process of, of, of design. Thank for you, Macarata. Minister Wong. Your time has expired, and I would ask you to address your um, quest answers to questions to the chair, Senator Stirl. Thanks, Madam President. My question is to the minister rep representing for infrastructure, transport, regional development, and local government, Senator Watt. Could the minister outline the findings of the ANAO's report into the Building Better Regions Fund? Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, and Senator Stirl, as a matter of fact, I can. Uh, this, and I know this is something that you followed very closely in your role as the chair of, the, of RAT, the committee we know affectionately as RAT in this place. Well, I don't know about you, Senator Stirl, but I think I, I thought that the election defeat that we saw recently of the former coalition government meant that once and for all, the coalition's rorts had ended. The scandals, the rorts, the media reports, them. finally we might be making it clear of that. But sadly, these reports have not even ended with the defeat of this government. Because last week, the Australian National Audit Office released yet another scathing report into the former government's management of the $1.15 billion Building Better Regions Fund. This report confirmed what we already knew about the former government. It was the latest rort from a government notorious for rorts. Sports rorts, uh, car Senator park Watt, rorts, stacking the your AAT. Seat. Resume your seat. And I would ask you to look to me when you're answering questions so that you can see that I'm asking you to sit down. Senator Rennick. Point of order, Chair. The Auditor General is a partisan hack whose credibility oh, was Senator trashed Rennick. in the Leppington Triangle. Rennick, resume your seat. <laughs> Senator Rennick, resume your seat. There is no point of order. Minister Wong. Draw that. Minister Wong, I've given you the call. Well. Point of order. Yes, I've given you the call. Oh, sorry, sorry, President. I didn't hear well. Obviously, the Auditor General can't uh, defend themselves. The the point of order is that I'd ask that you ensure the Auditor General is advised of what has just been said. Uh, in order that the Auditor General can avail themselves uh, of, of the protections which exist uh, under Hansard. Thank you, uh, Minister Wong. I'm not sure that it is my job to uh, advise outside bodies, but I'll seek the advice of the clerk, and if it is, I will do so. Senator Watt, please uh, continue your comments. Thank you, President. Well, I think Senator Rennick's interjection indicates exactly why the former government cared so little about accountability if that's the way in which they regarded the high office of Auditor General of this country. Senator Rennick. Now, what the report released last week showed is that communities in regional Australia have been dudded as the coalition actively ignored grant guidelines for their own political purposes in the largest open and competitive grants program available for regional projects. Regional communities with projects assessed as deserving were dumped Senator to accommodate McGrath. the political needs of a desperate, failing government Senator in its Davey. final hours. Now, we always said in the run-up to the election that the coalition spent public money like Senator it was Liberal Watt, National Party money. Please resume your seat. I would ask senators to be quiet when the minister is answering the question, because I need to hear the answers, as well as other senators in this place. Senator Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. As I say, we said repeatedly that the coalition spent public money like it was Liberal and National Party money, and here is yet more proof in this fund. Regional Australia deserves better, taxpayers deserve Thank you, better, Senator Watt. and they'll get it from Your this government. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Stirl, first supplementary. 
Yes, thank you, Madam President. My Lord, what did the ANO report find regarding panel composition and record keeping of decisions, Minister? Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Stirl. Well, one of the worst aspects of the report tabled last week was what it had to say about ministerial panel composition and record keeping of decisions. I mean, that presumes that there was record keeping of decisions, which of course there was not. Instead of transparent, accountable decision making, ministerial decisions were shrouded in secrecy. The ministerial panel made decisions on the basis of choose your own adventure criteria a non-exhaustive list of other factors that were not fully explained to those applying for grants. Now, I know that the Nationals have again said this was all about supporting the regions, but of course what happened with this program was that some regional areas were dumped at, to favour certain other regional areas. Would they maybe have been regional areas that had the right colour code next to them in a spreadsheet? We all know that's how the Nationals went about decision making. And who benefited most from this? The Nationals. The Nationals benefited the most as proper process was actively ignored. Those seats got $104 million Minister more Watt, than if the proper process had been followed. The time has expired. Senator Stirl, second supplementary. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Oh, goodness me. Order. Senator Stirl, resume your seat. I'll wait for quiet before I call Senator Stirl again. Senator McKenzie. Senator Stirl. Oh, with pleasure. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, now, Minister, are you aware of any other programs where similar concerns to those identified by the ANAO have been raised? Minister Watt. Thank you, President. And again, Senator Stirl, as a matter of fact, I do. Because all you need to do is look at year after year of the record of the former government to find rort after rort after rort after rort. Minister Watt. Now, let's just start. Resume your seat. I'm waiting for quiet until I ask the minister to again uh, resume his remarks. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. I can understand why Senator McKenzie, of all people, gets a bit toey when we talk about rorts in this chamber. But let's, so because, of course, we have sports rorts, where almost half the projects that were Senator funded McCarr were actually ineligible for funding until they had the colour-coded spreadsheet that emerged out of Senator McKenzie's office. We've got the car park rorts, $660 million of rorts which the former government used simply to target their own marginal seats. And while those opposite love to name-check regional communities, when it comes to funding them, the Auditor-General found that 27 per cent of regional grants awarded by the Commonwealth between 2018 and 2021 actually went to recipients from major cities. Remember the regional pool that just happened to be in North Sydney? That's how much they care about regions. They will rot till they die, Minister and that's why they're out of government. time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to Senator Gallagher, representing the Minister for Health. Tavistock Gender Clinic in the UK, a leading provider of gender dysphoria services, will close in 2023. Britain's National Health Service asked Dr Hilary Cass, past president of the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, to review the treatment of children with gender dysphoria. The Cass review found Tavistock Gender Clinic has failed vulnerable children and it recommended closing Tavistock. Finland, France and Sweden have taken the same decision for their gender clinics. Here in Australia, Melbourne's Royal Children's Hospital has many linkages with Tavistock. Minister, will you review Australia's gender clinics to ensure these clinics are not causing the same harm to vulnerable children that the CAST review found at Tavistock? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, as the minister representing the Minister for Health, if there are further information I can provide after question time, I would do so. I would say that the Royal Children's Hospital has an excellent reputation in um, paediatric care in Australia, um, staffed by uh, world-renowned um, medical professionals providing first-rate care to uh, younger citizens in the state, but also around the country. Um, and uh, I don't have close knowledge of the, the um, services they would provide to children with uh, gen gender dysphoria, but I have no doubt that they um, have the professional standards and the professional skills that are required to provide those young people and their families with first level <laughs> Uh, advice and health care. We have no information um, that's available to the government, to my knowledge, that uh, we should see it any differently to that. That is, that where there are children that require 
health services, that they access it through a children's uh, hospital, uh, that those services are accredited, there's professional standards in place, there's appropriate um, ethics and, and various advisory bodies that inform the delivery of those services, uh, and if there are concerns around them, that they are dealt with through the appropriate channels, um, not necessarily by politicians who have particular views about certain things, but actually deal with them as, through the delivery of health services, as we do so in a whole range of other areas of paediatric care. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Roberts, first supplementary. Thank you. So you can't say whether you will review. Evidence shows that the use of puberty blockers sterilises children and the impact on brain development is unknown. The Royal Children's Hospital is currently studying the impact of puberty blockers on children. We are literally offering a treatment we do not know is safe. Minister, when will the Australian Government intervene and demand the closure of all gender clinics in Australia until gender treatment in children is proven to be safe, if ever? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I think um, the government has um, no intention to intervene and ban particular services, health services, um, that are supporting families and supporting children to access the type of care that they need uh, for their individual situation. If there is further information I can provide, and I would say as, as a former health minister, um, you know, health services in this country, and we are very fortunate, uh, are heavily regulated. Um, the professionals who provide health services are heavily regulated. There are professional bodies in place. There are complaints mechanisms. There are a whole range of avenues, if there are concerns about any health service, uh, that those would go through and be dealt with. They are not normally dealt with on the floor of a parliamentary chamber. Um, you know, there are many families that need services. The Australian government is about providing health services, not Thank taking you, them away. Minister, the time has expired. Senator Roberts, second supplement. Thank you, Minister. One Nation listens to people, and this is what we're hearing. So we, we speak up for constituents. <laughs> Minister, a child who has not even reached puberty is incapable of knowing their own mind. Doctors and sometimes parents are taking these decisions on the child's behalf. Has the government considered the legal liability it is incurring for the government's part in this medical malpractice? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. Well, I don't agree that it's medical malpractice, um, nor do I agree with the proposition being put forward in the question that there are professionals and parents making decisions that are harmful to, to young people. Um, perhaps, Senator Roberts, it might be good for you to go and ask the health professionals that are providing these services how they provide them and how they support young people rather than just taking a particular view. I've always found that going in and asking questions and being open-minded about you know, not just necessarily taking some one individual's view about it but actually learning from the health professionals is useful. Um, but I, I also think it's um, you know, saying it's medical ma malpractice um, it goes too far for when you're looking at the vulnerability of the young people and children that are needing this kind of support through the health system, we should be very sensitive in how we deal with it. And as a government, we're keen on making sure that we are able to provide health services to anyone who needs it, regardless you, of their circumstances. The time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Labor's Powering Australia plan says in black and white that it will cut power bills for families and businesses by $275 a year for homes by 2025 compared to today. Will the minister representing the Treasurer guarantee that Australian families and businesses will see a cut to power bills of $275 a year by 2025 compared to today? Thank you, Senator Hughes. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, uh, President, and I thank uh, Senator Hughes for the question and, again, for leading with their chin on a matter around energy policy. <laughs> the first question was on wages policy, the, the deliberate design feature of the economic architecture. The second one, or well, third one, the third one is on energy policy. How many was it? 22 didn't land one of them. 22! 22 in nine years didn't land one know. of them. And what have we got now? An energy oh, crisis. Sorry. An Minister energy Gallagher. crisis. Uh, Senator Hughes. Point of order, direct relevance. The question was around 
power uh, bills being cut to families and businesses and a promise from Treasury that that occurred, not around climate policy. This was about cutting Thank you, Senator bills. Hughes. Thank Senator Hughes, resume your seat. Senator Hughes, I would ask Minister Wong. Senator Hughes. Senators. I would ask senators not to argue across the table, um, Minister Wong and Senator Hughes. Um, the minister is being relevant. She is talking about the price of electricity. I will listen carefully and uh, to the rest of. The senator. Uh, stood up, Senator Hughes, and called a point of order. It is not for other senators to interject. I've made my decision. I've indicated I will listen carefully uh, to the minute 31 seconds remaining. And if the minister isn't being relevant, I will direct her to the question. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. And the senator asked me where, uh, whether the government would guarantee um, Australians uh, lower power prices. And yes, we will. Uh, we will. We will put downward pressure. We will put downward pressure on energy prices. Absolutely, because we uh, are doing Minister, exactly what we seat, said please. we would do. I can't. I, uh, Senator Hughes, unless. Thank you, Senator Cash. I sat the minister down because I couldn't hear her answers. I will wait until there's quiet in the chamber before I call the minister again, Minister Gallagher. Thank, thank you, President. We will lower power prices by implementing the Powering Australia plan, which we took to the election, which was our one and only plan compared to their 22 plans that they didn't implement in nine years. And we will take the plan and the, the absolute gall of the opposition when we know that the member for Hume, two days before the election was called, actually amended the industry code for electrical uh, retailers on the 6th of April to delay the release of increases in the default market offer for New South Wales, Queensland and South Australia. That's what your government Order. did two days Order. before the election was called. You hid the increase of electricity prices. You hid it. Not Order. only did you not try to sweep Senator it under. Hughes. You amended the industry code so that people didn't know before the election. That's what you did. Now, we will clean up this mess. We Minister, will implement your time Powering has Australia. Senator Hughes, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, perhaps uh, Minister Gallagher might need to listen to the Australian Energy Regulator, because ever since the change of government, the Australian Energy Regulator has stated that increasing prices are likely to persist. Doesn't this show that the independent experts don't believe that Labor's policies will reduce power prices? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. And I would say that the 19.7 per cent increase to the default market offer that the go former government hid from the Australian people on the eve of an election, that is what you Senator did. Hughes. You didn't want people to know before the election that there was a 19.7 per cent increase coming their way. Our policy will put downward pressure on electricity prices by getting more renewables into the grid. We will do what we said we will do. We uh, will Minister put downward Gallagher, pressure. Resume your seat. I am struggling to hear the minister's answers. Please listen quietly. And interjections are disorderly, particularly those across the chamber. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you, Madam President. We will implement the Powering Australia plan. It will put more renewables into the grid. 82 per cent of uh, Powering Australia plan will be from renewable energy. It will put down pressure Hughes. on energy bills, on electricity bills. You guys weren't doing it because you didn't believe in renewables, right? You couldn't sign up to it. That is what will Your help put down with pressure on Minister. Senator Hughes, second supplementary. 
Thank you, Madam President. Now, I appreciate there's been a guarantee, which is probably a word not in the talking points because uh, no one else will say that word from Labor. But given the minister representing the Treasurer has actually really signed up with the rest of the Albanese government and its ministers to refuse to guarantee the $275 that was promised, and that's the number we're asking you to guarantee, isn't it true that the Albanese government has already broken its promise on power bill reduction. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Your time has expired. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, Madam President. From out of the mouths of those that continuously broke promises, we will guarantee that we will implement Senator our Hughes. Powering Australia plan, which will put downward pressure on electricity prices and assist households in a way that those opposite Minister, never did. Minister, please resume your seat. The minister, please uh, continue now that the chamber is quiet. Thank you, President. Uh, we stand by the modelling that underpinned our plan. We stand by our plan. We stand by Senator the Mazar, fact. Take a breath. We stand by the fact that we Senator will be Hughes. honest and upfront with the Australian people. We don't stand by the behaviour of those opposite, particularly the member for Hume, who, on the eve of an election being called amended the industry code so that the Australian people didn't go to the election knowing that under your watch there had been a 19.7 per cent increase in electricity. Uh, Senator Rice. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Your government has rushed the implementation of the previous Liberal government's new Workforce Australia program, providing only a 30-day suspension of mutual obligations that ended last week. You've now provided an additional 30-day suspension, but only for points-based activities. So people who can't attend their required appointments are still at risk of losing their payments, even when it's the broken system that has allocated them to service providers that are too far away or don't meet their accessibility needs. Will you commit to extending a pause on all mutual obligations for at least 90 days to ensure that no one loses their payments in this cost of living crisis? Thank you, Senator Rice. Uh, Minister Watt. Uh, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Rice, for the question. Uh, obviously, as you'll be aware, I'm the representing minister, so I'll certainly do my best to give you the best answer I can. Something that, something that happened when you were in government. I know it feels like a long time ago, but you'll get used to it. Um, uh, Senator Rice, uh, I'll White, certainly resume your seat. I'm asking senators to be quiet. I can barely hear uh, the minister's response to the question asked by Senator Rice. Minister, please continue. As, as I was, thanks, President. As I was saying, Senator Rice, I'll give you the best answer I can uh, as the repping minister and provide you with further information to your questions. Uh, this government uh, does accept and believe in the principle of mutual obligation, uh, and uh, that is something that Labor has supported for some time, not just in this government. Uh, but the way we go about doing that is by providing people who are unemployed with opportunities to enter the workforce, including by providing skills. Now, I've heard Minister Burke uh, talk about the fact that under this program that your question is about, um, that we are not simply going to be requiring people to apply for jobs endlessly, uh, but we are going to be providing people with opportunities to gain licences, to gain other skills, in order to help them into work. Um, so it is an alternative way of assisting people to get into work while, re while requiring people who are in, uh, in, in receipt of public funds uh, to take up those opportunities to help find work. That is probably even more important at a time in Australia when we have such low unemployment um, we do need to encourage everyone who's available to take up work uh, for themselves, for their families and for the country. Uh, so we, we stand by this program. I stand by what Minister Burke said, and I'm happy to provide you with further detailed answers to your questions. Thank you, Minister Watts. Um, Senator Rice, first supplementary. Despite promises of a clean slate, we've seen demerit points carried over from the old system, broken location services with people being directed to apply for jobs in areas they don't live in, um, inaccessibility for diverse communities, the dead naming of trans people in the system, and technical difficulty after technical difficulty. Minister, I know that you have promised to get back to us, but given the rollout has been an unmitigated disaster from day one, how can the government justify not extending the pause on mutual obligations you, until Rice, the, all the flaws expired. have been wiped Minister out? Watt. 
Um, thanks, uh, President, and thanks, Senator Rice. Uh, we don't believe that at this point in time a pause uh, is required to the system in the way that you suggest. Uh, we, we accept uh, that this program isn't perfect and we intend to go about fixing it. Uh, the, the technical issues that you refer to are obviously things that we take seriously, and if there are any additional flaws in the system that you uh, believe should be addressed, then I'd be more than happy to talk with you about that or to facilitate a meeting with the minister. Senator Rice, second supplementary. Thanks, Minister. You say that you take those issues seriously, yet right now I've, I'm hearing from hundreds of people who are terrified of losing their income support payments now through no fault of their own, while food costs are up and many people are struggling to stretch a dollar far enough to survive. What do you say to those people? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Minister, uh, Senator Rice. Uh, what I say to those people is that they can have confidence that a Labor government under Anthony Albanese, Prime Minister, will stand with them uh, in providing them with the payments that they require uh, and in assisting them to find work. Uh, people can always have confidence in a Labor government to do that. That is something that is core to our beliefs. Uh, and I noticed that senators over that side are laughing at that proposition, which you know, that's really something you'd need to ask yourself, Senator Van. Um, uh, Senator the... Watt, uh, Minister Watt, I'd ask you to direct your questions to the president and answer Senator Rice's question. Thank you, President. So what I say to those people, as I say, is that they can have confidence that a Labor government uh, will support them uh, and that we will continue to make systems and programs better, improve them. We will not have Order. a callous attitude towards people who are unemployed in the way that we saw repeatedly uh, from the former government, uh, and we will continue to make these programs better. Uh, Senator Pratt. And my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the government's response to the la latest wave of COVID-19? Thank you, um, Senator Pratt. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. And I um, thank Senator Pratt for the question and the opportunity to update the Senate on this very dangerous third Omicron wave uh, that is um, prevalent through the Australian community. There are many Australians who are losing their life every day, uh, Madam President. It's a very sobering reminder that we're still in the throes of this pandemic. Our clear message to Australians is you're not fully protected against COVID unless you have had your third or fourth dose. So for those people that are behind with their booster or eligible for their fourth dose, please go out there and get vaccinated. It will offer you individual protection, but also it will offer uh, significant um, protection across the community, particularly for those that are vulnerable. We understand that this is a really tough time for many Australians who are fatigued after uh, the past two years of this pandemic. But there are things we can all do to protect ourselves and help protect others. Uh, firstly, go and get your third or fourth dose. If you're eligible for antivirals, um, please get them. Ask your doctor for them. If you can't socially distance, then wear a mask. If you're sick, stay at home and also make sure that you stay up to date with the latest health advice. Australians know that the pandemic is not over and people should continue to act in accordance with the health advice. We have taken uh, action to take the pressure off our hospitals and protect the health of Australians by extending the National Partnership on um, COVID-19 for the public hospital system. We've extended that support to hospitals. We've expanded access to fourth doses. We've expanded access to antiviral medicines for eligible re uh, recipients. We're continuing to get information out to families in the community and also strengthen protections in aged care, where COVID-19 is still such a significant issue. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pratt. First supplement. Thank you, President. Could the minister update the Senate on the rate of uptake for the fourth vaccine dose? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Pratt for the supplementary. Since it, um, expanded eligibility has been made for the fourth dose, the number of people getting a fourth dose each week has tripled from around 180,000 a week to more than 500,000 per week. Over four million people have had a fourth dose which is up almost 1.5 million since we expanded the eligibility. More than 50,000 people got their third dose in the last week, but more than 5 million Australians have still not had theirs. 
Uh, data shows that people are more likely to get severe illness, admitted to ICU or, uh, or to die, if they're not vaccinated or are overdue for a vaccination compared with those who've had their recommended vaccinations. For those as aged 50 to 69, it's around 16 times more likely. Almost three quarters of the Victorians who died this year after contracting COVID had not had their third dose. Senator Pratt, second supplementary. Thank you. Could the minister update the Senate on the rates of vaccination for Australians in aged care? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Um, the Labor government has now made COVID-19 vaccination rates of aged care residents publicly available to drive the uptake of vaccinations as part of the government's winter plan. 78.8 per cent of eligible residents in residential aged care facilities have received a fourth dose, up from around 50 per cent on 9 June, when Minister Wells and Minister Butler wrote to providers to ask them to improve that rate. From today, uh, the aggregated data for each residential aged care home will be available in both a list and interactive map. And this data will be updated weekly on the Department of Health and Aged Care website. The Labor government's winter plan to boost vaccination rates is already working. At the start of June, less than 50 per cent of residents had a fourth COVID-19 dose, but vaccination rates have now increased to 78.8 per cent. Thank you, Minister. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, President. President. <laughs> um, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. Why is the government creating uncertainty for people with serious medical conditions by refusing to confirm funding commitments? On 1 March 2022, now Minister Butler announced funding for Patient Pathways Telehealth Nurse Program from 1 July 2022 as an election commitment. He has now stated that funding for the program is still being finalised and will be delivered if it is delivered through the October budget, but is still subject to an independent evaluation. Why is the government now forcing the provider into a period of uncertainty? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Madam <coughs> President. Um, I'll have to take that question on notice. Uh, the bits, well, I, I understand the bits around going through the budget process because those decisions are still underway. And as, as Senator Rustin from sitting on the ERC would note, uh, that in lead up to a budget, you do go through a process of assessing and approving and making decisions about what will be funded in the budget. And those decisions are currently before government. I am trying to be directly relevant. I beg your pardon. Oh. Sorry, Minister. Um, Senator Rustin. On a, on a point of relevance, I was actually um, asking the minister in relation to a commitment that had been promised on the 1st of July and why it was being considered in the budget in October when it actually had been committed to start on the 1st of July. Thank you, uh, Senator. I'll draw the minister's uh, attention to that part of the question. Minister Gallagher. Um, Oh, someone's trying to help me. Um, <laughs> thank you, President. Uh, if it is relating to a previously funded commitment from the government, we are also the former government. We are also going through a process around that. Uh, but I will look. I, I think, in the interest of the chamber and giving accurate information, I'm not briefed on this matter, and I would bring this information back uh, to the senator um, following question time. Thank you, uh, Minister. Senator uh, Rustin, first supplementary. Mm. Uh, why is the government creating certainty for young Australians facing mental health challenges by not honouring funding commitments? Young Australians living on Bribie Island were promised greater access to mental health services by the establishment of permanent official telehealth uh, uh, satellite services. Why is the government creating uncertainties for these vulnerable Australians by refusing to confirm this funding? And is it the intention of the government to put all of its election promises through the ERC? Thank you, uh, Senator Rustin. Minister uh, Gallagher. Thank you, um, Madam President. In relation to the second part of the question, yes, uh, we are a fiscally responsible uh, government and we will be putting through all our expenditure. I don't know how it worked under the previous government and whether you just did sign blank checks that went around ERC or whether uh, the Prime Minister Order. just authorised all the spending. Uh, but Order. we have. Well, I am trying to answer the um, question, Minister Senator Gallagher, Rennie. Please resume your seat. I wait for quiet. Uh, senators on my right, Minister Gallagher. Um, all of our election commitments uh, and other pressures that are coming our way, of which there are 
a substantial um, will be going through the ERC process. I don't think that is a surprise, or it shouldn't be a surprise uh, to anyone. In relation to the allegation around uncertainty, um, I Order. reject the insinuation in the question. Uh, Labor is always about investing and strengthening Medicare and health services, and we will do that, and you will see that in the October budget. Our second supplementary, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Why is the government creating certain for women escaping family, domestic and sexual violence by not honouring funding commitments? Funding was allocated in the budget for the Zara Foundation for a national expansion of their successful confidential financial counselling support to victims for survivors of FDSV. Why is the government now proposing to review the budget funding provided for this cri critical support? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. Well, I completely reject uh, the allegation that's implicit in the question, uh, completely and totally. We are going through a process where we are assessing all um, financial expenditure uh, against, uh, through our ERC process. Again, that is good government and good governance, and we are being responsible with the nation's finances. If that means going through a process to assess and, and determine what should go ahead and what shouldn't, then we are doing that. Uh, but we will be delivering on our election commitments and on our election policy in full. We will do what we said we would do. The Prime Minister has made that clear. Uh, Minister Gallagher, please finish. resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Um, Order. On, uh, on a point of relevance um, in relation to honouring of, uh, of election commitments, I mean, if the government is intending to honour its election commitments, why is it reviewing them? <laughs> I'm not quite sure that's a point of order, Senator Rustin. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. We're not uh, reviewing the merits of our policy commitments. We are going through an ERC process as we go through for the budget. I mean, that is how responsible governments that want to manage the budget properly conduct order. themselves. That is what we are doing, and we're committed to our order. election commitments. Thank you. Uh, Senator Waters. Yes, thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, uh, Senator Minister Gallagher. Um, with inflation and rate rises compounding existing housing and inequality crises, we need real action to address cost of living pressures. The Parliamentary Budget Office says Mr Morrison's stage three tax cuts will cost $224 billion over 10 years. Whereas building a million affordable social homes over 20 years would be an investment of $128 billion, with only a $27.3 billion cost to government. Why are you backing the already wealthy rather than fixing the housing crisis, which is far cheaper? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Well, uh, we're doing both. Um, we will. Del we will implement our election commitments. And one of those was, and we were asked many times around this, around the stage three tax cuts, uh, was that they have been legislated by the, for the, by the previous parliament and we were not uh, going to change that. That was our policy and we made that decision probably 18 months before the campaign. And, and as the Prime Minister has said, we will do uh, in government what we said we would do um, during the campaign and in opposition. On the housing crisis, yes, uh, that needs absolute uh, priority attention from uh, government. This is another one of those areas where nine years of neglect and um, refusal to work with states and territories have left us in the position that we are in now, where we will be picking up the mess left by the former government and working constructively with states and territories in on how to best deal with the crisis in housing, particularly for those at the, who need housing at the affordable end. We also have our Housing Australia Future Fund, which is one of those key commitments that we will roll out um, through the budget process to make sure that the Commonwealth is back at, in the game of housing and housing policy, um, which this, those opposite absolutely neglected and didn't treat with the priority that it should have de dealt with for nine years in government. Well, we didn't have a housing minister for a long time. We didn't have a national housing policy. I don't think we ever had a national housing policy. These are the things that need fixing, but so does that working 
across the states and territories who have a big stake in the game here to work with the federal government on improving access to housing and opportunities Order. for housing, and we will do that. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Thanks, President. The PBO says fossil fuel subsidies will cost $117 billion over the decade. The PBO also says that cancelling student debt would cost $65 billion. Why are you backing the fossil fuel companies to cook the climate instead of helping young people deal with the cost of living? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I think these are the PBO costings of the Greens policy commitments um, that they took to the election, and we are not implementing the Greens policy commitments. Um, but um, so that's that's the short answer to the question. But the, uh, Minister Gallagher, the, please resume your seat. I'm waiting for quiet. As Senator Birmingham and Minister Watt. Minister Gallagher. But um, having said that, uh, President, there is, I don't want to dismiss or trivialise the issue of cost of living on um, everybody at the moment, including young people, um, and particularly for those um, you know, lower income households. There's no doubt that higher inflation and higher than expected inflation, significantly higher than what was in the PFO update before the election, is putting enormous pressure on households, as is the, the rising interest rates that are, are you know, increasing because of this inflationary environment we're in. So government does need to focus on this. We are focusing on it. That's why the policies we took to the election are even more important to implement now. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Waters, second supplementary. Thanks, President. The PBO says that a corporate super profits tax would raise $286 billion over a decade and that adding dental and mental health care into Medicare would cost around a third of that at $100 billion. Why are you backing the big corporates instead of people who can't afford to access the health care they need? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, um, Madam President. Well, um, again, those were Greens' policy commitments taken to the last election. They didn't form part of Labor's policy agenda, um, and we are not. Uh, we we are absolutely about implementing our policy commitments to put downward pressure on the cost of living, to lower the inflation that's um, ravaging through the community and put downward pressure where we can on you know, people's cost of living. Um, that is fundamentally top priority for this government, our policies on childcare, on skills, on the National Reconstruction Fund, on Powering Australia Plan are all designed with that in mind, to deal with some of those supply constraints Senator in Thorpe. the economy and to put downward pressure on cost of living for Australians. Okay, uh, Senator, Minister Wong. I thank you. I'd ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, I have some additional information uh, for the Chamber in response to questions I took on notice from Senator Lambie last week relating to uh, family and domestic violence leave. Uh, I did write to Senator Lambie providing those answers at the end of last week, but I thought I should update the Chamber as well. Uh, the, the Albanese Labor government believes that workers experiencing family and domestic violence should never have to choose between their safety and their wages. Our bill to Parliament delivers a paid family and domestic violence leave entitlement to over 11 million employees in Australia, including casuals. This is a necessary and fair entitlement in line with Fair Work uh, Commission recommendations. This entitlement applies to all national system employees, and I table my response to Senator Lambie. Okay. Or seek leave to table? Table? Sure. Table. Apparently ministers can do that, eh? How about that? Thanks, Bully. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Rennick. Uh, I rise to take note of questions from Senator Hume and Senator Hughes. Senator Rennick. Okay. Uh, well, this is an interesting uh, situation we find ourselves in today, dealing with the cost of living uh, and real wages. It's interesting to note that at the end of the Howard government, uh, wages were increasing by 4.4 per cent a year. Uh, and by the end of the Rudd-Gillard government, they were down to 2.7 per cent a year. Now, arguably, we dropped a little bit to 2.4 per cent, but it was nowhere near the same level of drop as what happened in the Rudd-Gillard era. However, I would like to note, however, that in the last nine years, 
Uh, we have been racked by a, uh, a Senate that wouldn't pass bills. We've had a, a bureaucracy that works against us every time we get the chance. And of course, we had to get through COVID, uh, which was, of course, a very difficult time. Uh, and of course, it didn't help when the RBA uh, printed $300 billion and effectively fed that into the economy uh, without any real investment uh, in infrastructure. Uh, and you know, it's interesting to note the difference between 2019, 2020, and 2009. You know, when swine flu broke out in 2009, you know, the coalition opposition of the day didn't go and call for an immediate shutdown of the economy uh, like Labor did uh, when COVID broke out. Uh, and that's really, really important. Interestingly enough, it was well known that Nicola Roxon actually told the bureaucrats that we can't shut down, don't be silly. But yet again, we were forced to shut down and then the RBA went ahead uh, and of course, it's independent statutory authority. For some reason, people seem to think that we should outsource one of the most important economic levers uh, to unelected uh, officials. Um, but they went ahead and printed $300 billion and thought they'd go and uh, throw it out to the banks and then lower interest rates to 0.1%. Um, and it's going to take a lot of uh, winding back to uh, deal with the inflation that those reckless actions by the RBA, um, by the RBA has undertaken and uh, unfortunately they've raised those interest rates. So good luck trying to raise real wages when you've got inflation running at over 6 per cent uh, to the Labor Party. So it's not something I'd be getting too self-righteous about uh, right here and right now. But the other thing we need to talk about is Labor's promise of reducing energy bills by $275. Now, you know, this is where the roosters or the chickens have really come home to roost because we've been pursuing, you know, uh, the, the, the woke brigade have been pursuing a renewables at all cost, or what I like to call unreliables at all cost, um, and it is at all cost, I might add. Uh, and you know, billions and tens of billions of dollars have actually been sunk into the energy sector, and for what? What we've got is less reliability and higher power prices, and that's not surprising if you're going to go recklessly throw science under the bus, engage in junk science. Junk science, because does anyone know? Heat's kinetic energy, the energy of motion. The idea that it gets tracked uh, is a complete oxymoron. If you only step outside and look at a hot air balloon when they turn up the gas, the hot air rises into outer space there, you know, negative 270 degrees. It's called, the second, it's called the entropy of a system always increases, the second law of thermodynamics. Anyone with a basic understanding of year 12 physics would know that. Uh, but anyway, I digress. So we need to go back to why energy prices are increasing. And it's very simple, because in the old days you had a coal-powered fire station somewhere like Cogan Creek, which is 400 million tonnes of coal sitting underneath it or near around it, and you basically dig it up, you put it into the coal-powered fire station and it goes straight through the uh, uh, transmission lines, including the southern uh, interconnected to the southern states, um, and straight away it's into your, into your houses uh, or to the factories where we desperately need cheap, reliable energy. But no, 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 not with unreliables. Look, unreliables, what we've got to get is we've got to wait for the sun to shine and the wind to blow, um, and we've got to put all these different uh, stranded power stations around the country. And in order to join these power stations up, we've got to add transmission lines. Now, this, uh, the, the government opposite us, they want to uh, spend $20 billion on building transmission lines to connect all these new unreliable uh, power stations up. So, you know, that is a cost that isn't going to exist uh, if you never relied on unreliables in the first place. But it doesn't stop right there, because then you've got to build all these batteries to store the power for when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing. Now, this stuff costs a lot, a lot of money. Lithium, for example, is a 1% ore body. You've got to mine 100 tonnes of ore to get one tonne of metal. And then you're going to have to dunk it through hundreds and thousands of litres of sulfuric acid. Heavens forbid if that ever leaches into the ground water. Uh, and gets out to our Great Barrier Reef. I know the Greens were always talking about they love the Great Barrier Reef. Well, I can tell you what, when we've got sulfuric acid going everywhere from the creation of these lithium batteries, we're going to have more problems there. Uh, and then we've got the whole uh, problem of uh, stability. So we've got inertia control. All those things are going to add to the cost. And that's why power prices are going up. Uh, not to mention, of course, there's a slight problem in Russia and Ukraine, but I'll just leave that to one side for the moment. But let me tell you this, is that Labor will never reduce power prices unless Senator they back coal in this country. Time has expired. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, it's always remarkable when the opp opposition want to come into this chamber, they ask questions about wage growth. Wage growth. This is a government, well, this is an opposition that, whether it was under Abbott or Turnbull, or in fact Morrison, 
did nothing to support working Australians. They did nothing to support an increase in the minimum wage. They had, they had 10 years almost to do something for Australian workers, and they failed at every single obstacle. Now, we have inherited a huge debt. We've also inherited a situation where this uh, opposition, when they were in government, had no real plan for jobs. They had no plan at all when it came to reducing the cost of living. And all of a sudden, in the short period of time they've been in opposition, they want to come in here and lecture us about what we uh, should be doing and what we haven't done in what less than 12 weeks. I mean, realistically, I know you've learnt nothing at all from the election defeat, and I know it will take you some time to get used to being in opposition, but we went to the election with a plan a plan to grow jobs in this country, to increase wages for working Australians. We know and we understand the challenges that Australian families and Australians uh, are facing when it comes to the cost of living. But to do that, you need to lift productivity, you need to lift wages, and you need to ensure that we have skills and opportunities. That's why we went to the election uh, supporting uh, TAFE and ensuring that we have uh, the best workforce, the most highly skilled workforce uh, going forward, because we've got a plan. That's the difference between us and those opposite. Now, I know it, it's difficult to, to face an election defeat, particularly when you've been in government for so long, but the reality is the Australian people didn't buy your crap anymore. They just didn't believe anything that you took to the election. No one believed a word of what you've been saying for so oh, long Senator because Hughes. you have— Senator Hughes, Senator Boyd. Uh, it, Mr Deputy President, I bet that one hasn't been said wrong before. Um, we've gone the wrong way. I said madam rather than mister. <laughs> Everyone's getting in trouble the other way. Uh, point of order, unparliamentary language uh, was just used, I think, by uh, Senator Polly, and perhaps she'd like to withdraw. By the office editor withdraw if, if, if it caused offence, otherwise reflect on your language. Uh, I'm more than happy to, to, if I did cause any effect, I didn't think that I did, but sometimes the truth hurts, I guess. But I'd like to continue in relation to uh, the plan that our government has. The plan is to increase productivity, it's to support workers, ensure that we have the best trained and skilled workforce. I'd just like to remind those opposite that the care sector in this country, in aged care workers, this government for 10 long years had the opportunity to increase the wage and remuneration and skill base for aged care workers in this country, but did nothing. Nothing at all. In fact, people within the disability sector earn more money than those who are caring for some of the most vulnerable people. Now, I support the disability carers. I support them, but I also support aged care workers, childcare and early childhood educators. Now, we're a new government, but we've taken a plan to the people at the last election. Australians agreed with our agenda that we put forward and supported us. So when it comes to energy prices and the questions again today about whether we're going to keep our election commitment, well, yes, we are, because we know how important it is to the Australian people that a government keeps their election commitments, unlike those when they were in government. But when it comes to energy and renewable energy, well, we know the track record of the previous governments under Turnbull, Abbott and Morrison. They had no policy. They don't even believe in renewable energy. And I come from a state where we have led the nation with renewable energy, with our hydro. And so what we as a government will do is we will invest and we will, as I said from the outset, we will keep to our election commitments. We gave a guarantee that we would do everything we could to reduce power prices because it does have a huge impact on Australian families and businesses. So you can rely on us. So when you want to get up, as I'm sure that the next speaker will try and rewrite history and uh, blame the 
the current government for all the woes in uh, the community. I think what you will see over the next three years is a government that keeps to, to its commitments, will put Australian people and business ahead of those in opposition. And Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, uh, I too rise to take note of answers to questions today concerning real wage growth, concerning the cost of electricity prices. Uh, and we've heard from Senator Polly that the government has a plan to tackle inflation. <laughs> this reminds me, this reminds me, Senator Hughes, and I suspect that we both watched this show. We're, I won't start commenting on people's age. I'm going to show my age again. And uh, it, it, the West Wing, it was, it was one of my favourite shows, still is, you know, the <laughs> left wing president of, of the United States who bombs, <laughs> bombs other countries. Uh, and, and Josh Lyman is called up to the press secretary uh, one day, takes over in the, in, the, in, the, in the press room of the White House, and he's forced by the media to, to, to admit they have a secret plan to fight inflation. And that's what this government is channelling Josh Lyman. They must have a secret pan plan to flight inflation, because they're certainly not telling the Australian people what the plan is. They're certainly not telling the Australian people what the plan is. So the Australian people can come to two conclusions. They can come to two conclusions. They can either conclude that the Labor government has a secret plan to fight inflation, or they could conclude that the Labor government has no plan to fight inflation, because the left hand is not talking to the right hand, or should I say the left wing is not talking to the right wing of the Labor Party, because on the one hand they're promoting wages growth, which obviously will have an impact on inflation. Senator Wong knows that wages growth and inflation are linked. Without productivity increases, wages growth will fuel inflation. Simple as that. And without uh, downward pressure on energy prices, which there is no sign of under the current government's policy settings, without downward pressure on energy prices, you're going to see flow-on impacts through the economy, further inflationary pressures on the economy. And it's important that the Australian people recognise the fact that we do need a government that takes a fiscally responsible approach to the current economic circumstances. The former government—we are now in opposition, we understand that—but the former government made it very clear of the economic headwinds that were, Australia was facing in the years ahead. They are significant economic headwinds, and it's important that the settings that the government adopts in the upcoming budget uh, are appropriate for the time, and that includes tackling the scourge of inflation. Now, I am also old enough to, sadly, I was a young child, but remember the periods in, in, in Australia's history where inflation was absolutely out of control. Uh, and I can remember the impact on uh, my family's farming business uh, during the 1970s when inflation did get out of control. And we had a wage and inflation spiral that caused untold pain, untold pain to the workers of Australia, to working families, to the businesses of Australia. Uh, on our family farm, uh, under, under um, then Treasurer Keating, uh, the, the, mortgage, the overdraft uh, that our family's farming business operated on reached 22 per cent. 22 per cent. Now, many, you know, the generation of young people in today's economy, uh, those, those who have, have only lived under Liberal governments um, in their adult life, have seen extraordinarily low uh, interest rates for a long period of time. And we have now seen significant increases in a very short period of time. And so there is a challenge to this government. There is a challenge in the upcoming budget to show that they actually understand the economy, that they haven't bought into the modern monetary theory view of the world, where constant spending and constant borrowing is the way in which you actually fix this problem. We need to have a set of policies that are appropriate for the times. And in doing that, I can absolutely guarantee that this opposition will be looking at that budget with an absolute magnifying glass to ensure that the settings that he put in place 
put in place are appropriate for the times, that we actually do tackle the serious problems that are facing the Australian economies, the cost of living pressures on Australian families, the impact of inflation on Australian businesses. And that is the test for this government, and it is a test that they will be found wanting in. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Congratulations on your election as well, Mr. Pre uh, Deputy President. Well, Senator Hume, on question one, must have a very short memory in regards wages. In nine years, the Liberal government were the worst period of wage growth in Australia's history. We saw middle class people in this country wages decline under the previous government. And it was no accident because the former minister, Cormann, said, and I quote, low wages growth is a deliberate feature of our economic architecture. Well, when the Liberals left office, real wages were actually lower than they were when they entered office in 2013. The Labor share of income is it was at an all-time low, while profits were at an all-time high. The McKell Institute has found that an average worker would be earning $307 more per week if the wage growth achieved under Labor between 2007-2013 had been sustained through 2014-21. That's almost an extra $16,000 per year in the pockets of Aussie workers. Well, we also know what the cause of low wage growth has been over those nine years. We know that the government's policy was to drive wages down because that was part of their architecture. A tax on trade unions on raising, on ri and rising job insecurity have kept wages down for a decade. Take the mining industry, for example. The Minerals Council had admitted that labour hire casuals get paid for doing the exact same job, 24 per cent less in their industry, and it's rife through many industries. But the Liberals, of course, response to that is it was a made-up issue. Even the Minerals Council are admitting that people were getting ripped off. But it was a made-up issue. No wonder we have a wages problem and had a wages problem in this country for nine long years. Take gig workers paid just $6 an hour. Former Senator Stoker said that's what they signed up for. That was her response. And of course, I remember the former minister, Minister Porter, saying it was too complicated to turn around and give the minimum wage to those gig workers. And talk about, then of course, we then moved to the ABCC, which in six years had received $200 million in funding, but only recovered $5 million for workers. Six years, only $5 million in an industry that's rife with wage theft, wage exploitation. And of course, if you then look at what happened with the CFMEU in that particular time, in the last six months, the construction workers in the second half of 2021, the CFMEU got $17 million, $5 million for six years, $17 million, and you can see why they're anti-union, for six months. That's what real take-home pay that was being affected by this government under this government's previous government's watch. Now take their approach to migrant workers who were ripped off and exploited with full immunity under the, real, the previous government. As we heard in the Job Security Committee inquiry, Pacific workers earning just $3 an hour living in crowded rooms with 10 other people, on a farm, in one case, run by the former Liberal minister, Richard Alston. Surprise, surprise, surprise. It is just fundamentally in their DNA. They don't want to see workers getting a decent wage. They don't mind them seeing people getting as low as $6 an hour. They don't mind turning around and saying, spending $200 million whilst getting no recompense uh, a measly recompense for an industry that's been ripping people off, in the particular in the construction industry. And of course, they sat by when they said that's part of their architecture, to make sure that wages are kept low, kept low, and people are exploited in such a way. But then let's look at the you know, Liberals. You know, will they change? Well, Liberals thought it was a bright idea to campaign against the lowest paid workers in Australia, getting a $1 
and now a pay rise. They campaigned against it. And they have the hide to come in here and say, what are you doing about wage increases? Well, I'll tell you what, we'll always do more than you and we'll deliver what we've said we're prepared to do. Now, you might think the Liberals would have learned from the election that their low wage agenda is deeply unpopular with Australian workers. But there you are again. They're defending the ABCC, an agency that exists to keep wages down, safety and conditions low in the building industry. They continue to attack the trade unions. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, it's pretty telling, really, that it's the Labor Party who constantly sought to undermine the economy whilst in opposition at every opportunity, but now realise there's a lot of things out of their control, a lot of things that impact what happens in our economy occur globally, but that government is hard and that you actually have to be the ones to make decisions, to put in place policies. Now, on this side of the House, we don't ignore that there are global challenges, but what we're seeing from this new government is that with every decision they make, they make a bad situation worse. Senator Gallagher stood in here today after long platitudes through the campaign from everyone who made an appearance, usually to tidy up Mr Albanese's recent gaffe through the campaign, but then to make a promise that they would guarantee that Australians would see real wage growth. We now know that that's not going to be the case, and that is now being acknowledged by the Treasurer himself. They ran smear after smear after smear, and we just heard them continuing against the Coalition's record whilst in government, but are now failing to live up to their own promises and guaranteeing Australians a real wage growth. The hypocrisy is unbelievable, but unfortunately not surprising. Now, as I just said, we know on this side of the chamber that not every problem in the economy lays at the feet of the government of either persuasion, not that you would ever give that grace when you were in opposition. But we will hold you accountable for how you respond to these challenges. But the fact of the matter is becoming increasingly clear that you have no plan. You keep reciting a plan, which is apparently a plan for a plan, but that does nothing to instil confidence in the Australian people that you will be there to support them and alleviate these current cost of living pressures that they're experiencing. And today we saw Senator Gallagher also walking away from Labor's promise to, to reduce power bills by $275. Now, I will acknowledge that Senator Gallagher is the first Labor minister who's perhaps moved off the talking points that did offer a guarantee to lower power prices. But actually articulating a figure seems to be beyond the scope of this new government. We've seen Senator Watt can't say a number, and Senator Gallagher here today could not mention the $275 reduction that was promised to all Australian households by the end of 2025. She talked about being honest with the Australian people, but danced her way around guaranteeing the exact figure. But again, the important thing here to note is for all of talk, Labor's talk on easing the cost of living crisis during the election campaign, they don't have a plan to make this a reality. They don't understand how to address inflationary pressures. And I just note Senator Brockman's contribution of perhaps like the West Wing and they're taking their lead from Josh Lyman that they've got a secret plan to flight inflation. Unfortunately, though, looking at those opposite and their performance over the last week and a half in this place, uh, that they may actually be trying to emulate Veep more than the West Wing. Uh, but, uh, well, I'm sure there's a couple over there with the House of Cards rhetoric ready to go. There's a little, someone who fancies themselves a Frank Underwood. But uh, at the moment, I think we're just seeing Veep being played out in each act. At least if they were following the West Wing episode by episode, we'd know what was coming next. Uh, and uh, we do know that some of them have a penchant, we might say, for plagiarising of speeches. So we should probably run a few of them via some of those checks to see how many West Wing lines they pull out as they make their presentations. But this is part of a broader pattern here. The Labor Party complained that the previous government, that we weren't doing enough, things weren't happening, and they arrive in government with absolutely no plan to address any of the issues that they're facing. They complained about debt and then proposed to add more debt than the coalition. 
They said real wage growth wasn't good enough under the coalition. Now they refuse to guarantee Australians will see wage growth under their government and have acknowledged that is highly unlikely. They've also said that we refuse to, re to address the cost of living crisis and have now broken their promise to reduce power bills by $275 for families and business. So given Senator Gallagher's answers today, I can assume that there's a lot of Australians out there, a lot of small businesses, are starting to have a look around and that buyer's remorse might be starting to creep in. They might be seeing they've been sold a pup because it's clear Labor has no feasible plan, drive up wages, reduce power bills as they promised they would. Senator Hughes, thank you. I'll put the motion as moved by Senator Rennick. Those the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Do I have someone? Senator Cox. Uh, I move the, that the Senate take note of Senator Wong's response to Senator Thorpe's question. Thank you. Senator Cox, you have the um, My colleague, Senator Thorpe, asked a very, very simple question about how Labor proposed uh, the voice to parliament, which will impact on First Nations sovereignty. Unfortunately, Minister Wong refused to answer this question straight, in a straightforward way. And instead, Minister Wong said that the government are taking a pragmatic approach to what, uh, when it comes to the voice to parliament. Now, we as First Nations people of this country um, cannot risk our sovereignty because the government thinks it's pragmatic. That is completely unreasonable. And sovereignty is the underpinning principle that we can afford and should not afford to um, make history making changes through truth treaty voice when we are talking about the constitution. When we talk about sovereignty, we're talking about the relationship of being a sovereign First Nations people. And that is linked to our, our connection to our water, our skies, our totems, and all of our systems, our kinship, our law, our language, our culture. It is all embedded in that. First Nations sovereignty is not about, um, <clears throat> is about putting First Nations people in the driver's seat when it comes to making decisions about our community. And it's not about selling that out. Our culture, our country, and our sovereignty are important and should be the primary aspect of what drives all of this change. Mm -hmm. It's about being part and being in charge of our own destiny because that is, in fact, what truly represents self-determination. First Nations people have an inherent right to protect our lands, our waters and our skies, as well as our totem, because we can't survive without these things. We care for country and it will care for us. We cannot survive without that. And it's an assertion of our rights to our lands that all First Nations people have. And this is what led to the Mabo decision. It reasserted that this land was never terra nullius. And I've got a quote here from Bunjalung Wurma saltwater woman, Phoebe McIlwraith, who writes that my sovereignty predicates the creation of the English language, and it does not come from the crown or the throne, but from the sea and the soil. No parliamentary oath could ever take that away from me. And this is in fact true, and we saw this being enacted just right here in the chamber this morning by Senator Thorpe. There's another quote from Aileen Roberts, Robertson, Morton Robinson, sorry, a Gulpul woman, who says their sovereignty is incommensurable <clears throat> to ours. They cannot see nor understand our sovereignty and therefore can never recognise it. These are all true parts. And unfortunately, the incoming government don't understand that and have not been able to articulate that and certainly didn't answer the question today um, on behalf of the, uh, the Minister for Indigenous Affairs. And author Amy Maguire, a Durrambul woman, South Sea Islander woman, notes the extent in which First Nation dissenters feel that there is a great cloak that has been put over sovereignty and treaty, which has been now it's almost rendered invisible in the ways of what People are calling the positive coverage of what was the Labor's first attempt, the recognised campaign, and now constitutional recognition. Amy Maguire also suggests that despite efforts to repress these views, there's still no calls for a treaty or sovereignty, and they are not white noise. I also want to touch on the second question Senator Thorpe asked today about how the government's proposed 
proposal honours the principles of free prior informed consent. Well, of course, Senator Wong thought that we needed consent to actually make sure we were moving forward with the Uluru Statement, and that's in fact not what it means. Informed, free prior informed consent actually has to be at the heart of decision making. It's at the heart of everything that impacts on First Nations people and their issues. So how can we pretend that these First Nations, um, giving First Nations people a voice, that they aren't even deciding the voice to parliament themselves is about self-determination. In the current proposal, the colonising parliament would have the powers to decide on the vote's composition, functions, procedures, and it's definitely not self-determination, nor is it free prior informed consent. And when it comes to treaty, Minister Burney has said that the truth and treaty processes can be un undertaken simultaneously to the voice and that truth and treaty will take time and they need to be started now. So it's time for the federal government to show some leadership and back the Makarata uh, Commission and put it back on the federal agenda. We need to see a clearer commitment on all the elements of the Uluru Statement. And Thank I you, urge the Senator government Cox. to— I move the, mo the motion— <clears throat> I put the motion moved by Senator Cox. Those of the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion?